Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 31. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Well, in 2021, just a few years ago, uh, a video was put out, and I'll show you in a moment, uh, showing what's going to happen uh, if everything goes to plan in the city of Bainstown. Uh, before I show the video, I want you to just have a think. Um, firstly, what do you see? What do you notice in the video? And secondly, how does that make you feel? And I might, after the video, get you to maybe talk to someone around you about what you saw and what you feel. But let's have a look at the video.
Um, okay, what do you see and how do you feel? Uh, we're looking at the city of Bankstown, and really, that video shows you what kind of a city that it might become. Uh, have you ever thought about the importance of cities? Why are cities so important? Well, people who analyze these things show us that cities are important because of uh, these factors, and they will start with C. Um, commerce and culture, right? It's where commerce and culture is centralized, but not just that, commerce and culture flows from cities. Right, whatever city, in, in whatever country, that's where commerce and culture flows from to the rest of the country. Collaboration and community, uh, be, the best come together to invest towards commerce and culture, and that's why it's so central. Um, but then also communities, plural communities are formed. Uh, you get in cities, you know, Groups of migrants, for example, for those of us who are migrant communities, uh, form in, in, in subgroups around cities. That doesn't happen in the countryside, does it? All right, it doesn't happen in Bathurst. It happens in Sydney, in Melbourne. Uh, in convenience and comfort, and, and by comfort, I needed a word that started with C, but really I meant prosperity, okay? Um, that cities are places you go to because it's convenient and cities generally have a higher level of prosperity. It's easier to be prosperous or people move into the city for prosperity. Um, in the ancient world, uh, not so much in our case now, in the ancient world, cities particularly were also for protection and safety because cities had walls and so on. Now, if you're a city dweller like me all your life, then you take for granted the good things of cities. And when you look around, they're the kind of things you see. And when you saw that video, you know, that's why I asked the question, what did you see? But today's question I want us to ask is, what does God see? What does God see when he sees cities? Well, we read earlier Acts chapter 17, and Paul, the apostle, is in the city of Athens. And the context is, if you remember a couple of weeks back, John Walsh preached uh, from Acts, I think, 13 for us, uh, 14, sorry. And, and Paul was basically having a really rough time as a missionary. He was being chased around by people who wanted to kill him. Well, this continues on from that. He's still being chased around the whole of the Mediterranean. And so he's in Athens, but not because he planned to be there at that time. And he's in Athens waiting. And while he was waiting, we read, this happened. Now, you need to know, Athens in Paul's day, this city was not quite the Athens at the height of the Greek civilization. You know, the, the Athens of Socrates and Plato isn't quite this. But it was still a major, major center in the Roman world, the center of culture especially. So while Rome was ruling, not Greece, while Rome ruled, it was Greek that people, the common people, spoke. And it was Greek culture that united all the cultures of the Roman Empire. So Athens is sort of like New York City. So you know the capital of the US is not New York, it's Washington DC. But if you want to see culture and commerce, you go to New York. Um, in China, it's probably Shanghai, even though the capital is Beijing. And we all know in in, in Australia, it's not Canberra, right? <laughs> it's Sydney, and maybe our Melbourne, Melbourneian friends will want to think it's Melbourne. Good luck. Um, okay, but you know, it's a difference between the capital versus where the cultural centers are, and that was Athens. And so, all of th those things true of cities would be especially true of a place like Athens commerce, culture, collaboration, community, convenience, comfort. Now, Paul, as we understand, this might have been his first time, probably his first time in Athens. And if you were in Athens at that time, even if you go to Athens now, you know, you're going to be wowed by the kind of things. It's like first time walking into a place like New York City. It's like, wow, everything is catching your eye. Um, the ancient Athens would have had the Parthenon on top of the Acropolis, surrounded by all these theaters and temples. It would have been an amazing sight, right? Not ruins like they are today, but actually built up. So Paul's there, perhaps for the first time, and if I was in his shoes, I'd be looking around going, oh, look at this. But that's not what happened when Paul was there, was it? Let's read again what happened. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Now, I want you to notice that Paul felt something when he saw something and then he acted. All right? That, I think, gives us God's perspective on cities. And that should be ours. What Paul saw, what he felt, and what he did. 
So that's what we're going to do for the next year. We're actually not going to go through the whole passage. We're really going to look at these two verses. All right, let me pray as we go a little bit deeper into it. Father, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you may help us to see as you see, to feel as you feel, to act as you would have us act, all for the glory of Jesus here in Bankstown. Amen. So Paul saw, Paul felt, Paul acted. The first thing he did was he saw. He was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. In other words, Paul saw behind all the glitz and glamour, and he saw the truth. He looked at the city and he saw its worship. Because here's the thing, underneath commerce and culture and collaboration and community and all those C words, underneath all of that is worship. This was a city full of idols. Greece had its 12 main deities, but Rome incorporated those 12 and added another bunch, and Rome had about 60 different deities. There was a deity, a god, for every aspect of life. And so it was actually these deities that drove the commerce and culture and the promises of comfort and convenience and brought people together for collaboration and community. Now, I want to suggest to you that that is no different in any of our cities. Because here's the thing, idols are not just religious icons. Idols are anything that we devote ourselves to and we put number one in our lives. Be it money, or power, or prosperity, or family, or reputation, or pleasure, or security, or intimacy, you name it. They can all be idols. So that video of Bankstown, really, it's presenting Bankstown as a sort of a a, a gateway city. And I think that's what it will become. Bankstown will become sort of a gateway to the southwest, if you like. A city within a city, right? A CBD within a CBD. Sort of like Parramatta is already. But as Bankstown becomes this gateway, as this becomes a city within a city, what will be driving Bankstown? What will intensify as Bankstown grows like this? The answer is worship. And I don't mean temples, and I don't mean churches, and I don't mean mosques. I mean the worship of idols. The idols of money and influence. The idols of prosperity and family. The idols of security and pleasure. That will be driving Bankstown as it develops. That will be intensified. And so the question here today is, do you see that? Do you see that? Because we need to see that. But more than seeing it, when we see it, will we feel it as God feels, as Paul felt? So point number two, you see, Paul felt. How did he feel? He was greatly distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So this is from the head to the heart, isn't it? Literally, it it provoked him in his spirit. It's a gut reaction as he saw these things. It's... You know, whichever side you take in what's happening in the Middle East, it's when you see the footage of devastation in Gaza and Lebanon. Doesn't that just bring about a gut reaction, a provoking in your spirit? That's the thing that Paul felt. Now, in the Old Testament, this kind of term, being provoked in the spirit, it's, it's used about God. When God is provoked by his people's idolatry, and rebellion. And so Paul's reaction is really a reflection of God's reaction. He feels how God feels. Because here's the thing, Paul has a passion for the glory of God, the true one and only God. Because how can the eternal and invisible God be robbed of his glory? When God's worship is traded for the worship of statues and idols, which in the Greek and Roman world, as it is today, are false gods. And they're created by, not God, they're created by us, aren't they? You look at the Roman and Greek gods, you realize they're just bigger and more powerful versions of ourselves with all of our flaws. That's robbing God of his glory when you reduce God to that. But not only was Paul driven by a passion for God's glory in God, he was also driven by a passion for the glory of God in us. Have you thought about that? The glory of God in us. We are his image bearers. God's glory was deposited in us, humanity. And when we worship rightly, 
We reflect God's glory and goodness. But with idolatry, what happens? A great exchange happens. We won't read these out, but Romans 1 is where you see this great exchange. When we exchange God for idols and we exchange the truth of God for a lie, we also ourselves get distorted as human beings, as image bearers. God's glory is twisted in us. Because idols, they always promise much, but they take more, don't they? Idols become masters. They enslave you. Just take money, right? Or greed, broader. Greed leads to addictions like gambling. And they rob someone of humanity. When you see someone addicted to gambling, you really see there's a shell of a person that they were and were meant to be. A shell of the glory of God in us. See, when you see behind a city to its idolatry, to its worship, you will see that the same worship that drives commerce and culture and community and collaboration and comfort and convenience also leads to what? The same worship leads to corruption and leads to crime because those words, those C words, also get intensified, don't they? Amplified in cities in a way that it's not in the countryside. So let's just look at some of the the commerce side. The idols that promise unequaled prosperity also in cities bring unequaled poverty. You don't see poverty in the countryside like you do in the cities. Not just poverty of money, of course. It's also poverty of soul, right? Or culture. Where do the most dangerous and damaging cultural influences come? They're not coming from the country. They come from the cities. Or community and collaboration. It's funny, isn't it? People will live and work closer to each other, but as we know in cities, they are far more lonely. And conflicts are heightened in cities. See, that's what's in store for Bankstown, friends. Look behind the glitz and glamour of that 2021 video. It's all very exciting, but if you see behind it, it's a tragedy. Now, you might be saying, it's okay, it's okay. I don't actually live in Bankstown. Well, remember... Wherever you live, it flows from the cities to the suburbs, from the suburbs to regional areas. See, what's true of Bankstown is true of Sydney, because Bankstown is going to be a city within a city. What's true of Bankstown will be the true, true of the whole of the southwest. What's true for Bankstown will impact all of the migrant communities in and around our area. So do you have eyes to see it? And when you see it, are you provoked in your spirit? Do you feel distressed? No wonder God reserves a day of judgment for this. And just skipping ahead to Paul's sermon we read earlier, Paul says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. But much more than just anger and judgment, which he's right to do, God's heartbeat for cities is ultimately love. I'm so glad our kids are doing Jonah. Um, Skipping right ahead to the end of Jonah, God manages to spare the city of Nineveh, disaster and judgment. Jonah's unhappy with it. But this is what God says to Jonah. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? How does God see cities? Well, he sees behind it to its worship. He feels distressed and provoked. He has judgment coming, but he loves them. And he doesn't want anyone to perish. And so when Paul acts, my third point, it is to address it from the standpoint, ultimately, of love. Remember, this was not his initial travel plan. Paul was waiting. I mean, Paul could have taken a short sabbatical, a short holiday. He could have played the tourist. He could have just minded his own business. I I would have done any one of those three, all three, if I was in Paul's shoes. But you see, what Paul saw provoked his spirit so much, he had to act. And so he did. Now, even before the famous speech that we read earlier, which we won't look at in detail, but even before that, look what he did. Verse 7, he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. In other words, while he was waiting, he took action every single day. 
And he did it in all the key places to all the key people, both Jews and Greeks, to both the religious as well as the non-religious, or at least those who worship the true God, as well as those who didn't and worshiped all the other idols. Now, that would be a sermon for another day. Okay, that speech in Acts 17 is actually quite famous and quite important, especially in mission and uh, and the kind of thinking that goes behind mission. Um, Paul lays the groundwork by going into the heart of the city. You notice that he goes to the marketplace to do his evangelism. The marketplace is not just where the shops are. Uh, It's a little bit like European forums back in the day, in the medieval world especially. It's where the life of the city come together. It's where culture happens. Um, The marketplace in Athens would have been the council building, the law courts, the university, the hospital, the cinemas, and the shopping center all rolled into one. In other words, it's where we are right here in chapel in French. You know, because that hospital is going to be across the road, got shops across the road, shopping center down the road, university, right? Council building. That's kind of this... That's the marketplace. This is the marketplace. I wish I could go into that. I won't for today. I just want you to note that what Paul saw and felt led him to act. For him, that meant speaking and preaching the gospel, the good news, the good news of a God who he says in verses 24 to 28 is not so hidden, not so far away that people have to turn to idols to find or set up an altar to an unknown God just in case so they can hedge their bets. The good news of a God who is coming in judgment, yes, but has given every single person an opportunity to be saved because Jesus was sent, right? The Son of God became a man, died and rose again so that we can be saved, verses 30 to 31, and he's coming back to judge. We have the same task. This is the point. We have the same task, the same opportunity here in Bankstown to share the good news of Jesus, and we need to do that. We do that from here. No, we'd, we'd love this church to be able to grow as Bankstown grows. So that anytime, anywhere, people of all different cultures, backgrounds, age groups can just bring people and hear the gospel in all these different ways, on Sundays, outside of Sundays. But we also want to not just do it from here, we want to also do it out there. I'm really encouraged because what uh, Pastor Kitty is doing, and we've spoken about, um, she wants to take Mandarin service people out there next year and, and do some street evangelism, talk to locals. And I've said, hey, let's get involved, let's do it together. All right, so that's coming. Because we want to do it out there as well. But more than just speak it, the gospel is also something we need to live and embody. And I'll tell you why. Because here's the thing. If Bankstown is a city within a city, or a gateway to the southwest, if you like, then what is the church? What is the church if not a city within a city as well? A gateway to a greater city, the New Jerusalem. See, why does Jesus use the image of a city to describe his people? He says it's a city on a hill that can't be hidden. Why is the new creation in Revelation 21 and 22 a massive city? Because church, if you think about it, at its best, is where collaboration and community happens. Church, at its best, is where the culture of the kingdom flows from. We're a different kind of commerce, a commerce of generosity and sacrificial giving and freely giving because we freely receive happens. And it's all driven by worship. You see, all of those C words ultimately are truest of the church, the city within a city, the city on a hill, the gateway to the new Jerusalem. And it's all driven by not idolatry, but by our worship of Jesus. And the church went at its best will be that city on a hill that shines in the darkness and brings renewal in the midst of decay. That's what God can do through us, this little church, and also all the other churches. He can do that through us in Bankstown so that we might become a city within a city. But in order to do that, my final point is this. Will you play your part? Let me first ask you, what brings you or what brought you to Bankstown? Especially if you didn't grow up here, you're not a local here. Um, Some of you, you live in the area or the suburbs surrounding Bankstown. And so it makes sense to come here, right? For your shopping, for your leisure, all that kind of stuff. For others, maybe you don't live very close at all. So you come here because primarily this is your church. These are your people. This is your community. What brought you to Bankstown? What brings you to Bankstown? Well, here's the challenge. Whichever category you belong to, here's the challenge. 
Whatever your reasons for coming to Bankstown, will you change your relationship to the city? What I mean by this, change your relationship to the city. Everyone comes to a city because of what the city can do for them. Isn't that true? Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. The city that provides comfort and convenience and community or even church, you come to the city because of what the city can do for you, because of what you can gain from this city. Christians are the same. We come because this is our city. This is where our church is. This is where our community is. We gain something from it. But if we see and feel and act to be a city on a hill, then that's got to be different, right? And here's the challenge. Relate to this city, not for what you can get from it, but for what you can give to it. That's the big paradigm shift I would love us, God would love us to have. You stop coming to a city because of what you can gain from it, but what you can give. Not how it can serve you, but how you can serve it. Because our true city is the one to come, our true home. And God has placed us in this city at this time so that we, of all people, can love it and serve it and bless it and let him use us to transform it. So will you do that? Will you have that different relationship to the city? Even if you don't live in Bankstown and this is in your city, Will you love it because God loves it? Will you serve it because God has brought you to it and it to you? Will you invest in this city through this church? Because the gospel, when it impacts here, as it does with major centers, right? that's our hope and dream, that's our vision, as the gospel impacts here, will have a flow-on effect to perhaps the entire southwest and the entire greater city of Sydney. That, that's the opportunity that it has. So even if you don't live here, will you love it with us? So how can you play your part? Well, firstly, you can pray. It all starts with prayer. It's all driven by prayer. Because this is God's work. So will you pray with open eyes? You see? Will you pray with aching hearts? Now, one of the best ways to do that is to join a prayer meeting. And we tell you about that. Lots of times, so if you're not part of that, let me know. But you can also pray on your own. Pray with new eyes, with new hearts. Secondly, get deeply and sacrificially involved. We need to mobilize, we really need to mobilize the entire body of Christ, and even more so in the coming years. We need all of your God-given talents and gifts and abilities. Even if you think, I'm not that gifted, I can't do it. There's something that God has given you to be able to do. There really is, because every part of the body matters, says the Bible. So will you, and a lot of you already do this, right? And we're so grateful. But will you? In the coming year, especially, put your hand up to serve in all the ways that we'll need in the coming year. Like, there can be regular things like kids' church and music and welcoming all the kind of regular ministries. But then there's also the occasional ones like kids' club and carols and Lunar New Year. And there's other stuff that we haven't even dreamed of that, that we would love to see. We'd love to see ESL classes going again. We'd love to see, you know, a f- being able to provide for people who are doing it tough in our community with um, food and, you know, hampers and all that kind of stuff. All of that takes sacrificial involvement from every member of the kingdom of God, every member of the church. So will you do that? And then finally, and I want to say this, if you're a new person, just ignore everything I'm going to say right now, okay? Uh, This is probably the first time and the only time I have so far spoken from up here in a sermon about money. So I'm just going to do it. For insiders, for our people, if you're a new person, we're just glad you're here. We don't want your money. Just enjoy. All right. But as we prepare for the year ahead, and I can tell you now we're preparing to budget, or the the, the parish council, the wardens are, uh, realize that we don't actually have a lot of reserves, okay? Um, In the merge, SWEC will obviously come with a lot less. Uh, St. Paul's, you can ask the wardens. But St. Paul's doesn't have a lot of savings. So we need people who will give regularly, 
and generously. Regular, generous giving helps us to budget better. All right, so if you're not doing that, um, you know the way to do it, email that address and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? We also need people, and this is not going to apply to most of you, but it may be someone here. We also need people with kind of deeper pockets. Maybe God has blessed you. Maybe you're in a stage of life financially. Things are going well. I don't know. We also need people with deep pockets to give a little bit extraordinarily, out of the ordinary. A few maybe big one-off sums or sponsoring particular projects so that we have a bit more of a financial buffer. Let me just tell you some of the things in the short term in the coming years that we would need to finance. So in the short term, really necessary additions like a new fridge, um, kids' space needs to be done up, aircon for the kids' spaces. Um, all of that eats into, as I said, not a lot of savings. So that's kind of diminishing our savings every time something needs to be done because it's really not budgeted. In 2025, it's really exciting. We're going to put on two student ministers who are going to Bible college next year. You know them, and I'm preempting it. Sorry, Madam Wendy, I'm going to tell them that, you know, they were going to tell you in a couple of weeks' time when they have the fundraising. But Madam Wendy are going to come up officially as student ministers. And there's actually one other person um, who's interested uh, potentially of coming on. And, and, and if he does come on, he'll be a real asset as well, as well as we, we get to help train them for a lifetime of ministry. Three, two or three student ministers is about $10,000 per student per year because they're giving up a lot, their careers and so on, financially, to be able to go to college and come. So we want to help them and support them. That's in 2025. That's just next year. Um, in 2026 and beyond, we would love to add to our staff team with someone doing maybe a children's pastor or something like that. Um, we would love to be able to support Kitty, Pastor Kitty, for what she's actually doing. Supports. Pastor Kitty does so much. Um, and I don't think we're supporting her quite enough for what she's doing. We would love to put on MTS trainees, right? interns, and so on. That's just the next two years. There are kind of a couple of things that we love to do. Now, for those who aren't Anglican, you might be thinking, hey, don't you just get money from this, you know, from the Anglican church, from the Sydney Diocese? Well, no, that's not what happens. Okay, you don't just get money. Um, every parish is kind of self, self-sustained and self-contained. But I will tell you this, the Diocese of Sydney is investing in Bankstown. It is working hard so that we might one day, hopefully, have church facilities right here to be in sync and grow with the city of Bankstown as it changes around us. Right? That's all I can tell you now. But if, if that's a possibility, as some of you know, that's been something that we've been dreaming about, you know, that, that'll be great. Like imagine if that video showed... By the way, did you notice that video when it showed the university and the hospital um, and the shops? A lot of that is actually just exactly where we are because that hospital is, is going across the road just there. Right? And the uni, obviously, in the 2021 video wasn't up yet, but you already see that. WSU is already there. So a lot of the, the uh, graphics is showing what's happening in sort of this corner, this corner of, of Bankstown, which is quite exciting. Um, and and it would be great if, if what, what's here um, can be able to facilitate that and reflect that. But of course, buildings are just buildings, and all of that will be meaningless without a church that's ready. Because churches and buildings, as you know, church is people, right? So that's what we need to be building at this time, people. Ministries, gospel, community, life, outreach. We're merging in 2025. I really think in the providence of God, it didn't happen three years ago. It didn't happen nine years ago when we started Sweat Bankstown. At this time, in this place, this is no accident. Can you see the hand of God in that? I think a lot of us can, can't we? This is no accident. And it's not surprising. Acts 17, what did Paul say? God orchestrates things behind the scenes so people would seek him and find him. That's what he's doing. God has been and is at work. Now we've got a chance together as a church to steward that well. So will you play your part in it? Will you play your part? Will you pray first and foremost? Will you get deeply and sacrificially involved? Will you partner with us financially?